So I'm glad to start our panel on uh, edge IE application, and I'm glad to uh, represent uh, three uh, speakers, three panelists uh, for today. It's Professor uh, Ionescu, who is the head of the lab, uh, nano lab at EPFL. Professor Terrier, he is uh, head of uh, the direction of IE uh, trustworthiness in the uh, CA and uh, Professor Mitra from uh, St Stanford University. So please uh, ask your questions. We, we still have questions from both speakers <laughs> this morning and afternoon. And uh, then uh, we have some topics to discuss if there are uh, less questions from the audience. So I invite you to ask your questions and uh, welcome. Thank you. <coughs> Do you have any questions just to, for start? <laughs> Thank you. Work? Yeah. So I got a question about your presentation before. You were talking about the 3D layers. And I was interested in, let's say, I, I was wondering how you would place different computing elements, different elements in your stack. So is there a, a way, an optimal way to arrange arrange different layers, or uh, it's, uh, I mean, everything the same. So I, I guess that it's different having all the computational layers at the bottom, for example, and all the memory elements above. And maybe there is an arrangement that maybe improve performance in some way. And, uh, and after that, is this, I mean, in case there is an optimal arrangement, is this related to specific applications, or is something that can be generalized for uh, different tasks? Thank you. Yeah, good. You know, I think lots of questions. Yeah. So, do you use a microphone or? Yeah, is this being recorded or what? This is recorded. Oh, I see. So then the microphone. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. You know, so I I, I think these are important questions. Uh, I, first of all, I do not think the community knows the answer to all your questions, but uh, but I can you know tell you bits and pieces, right? So. As I was talking about, you know, even if you take 3D folding that I was referring to, remember that before I said, you know, how existing 3D is like 3D folding, you take a circuit and then you fold it in multiple layers. You know, that's not what, you know, I'm suggesting, right? You know, that's not what our next 3D is. But uh, even for 3D folding, this is an important question. You know, if, forget about, you know, what we are going to do with next 3D and I'll give you some answers there too. So even for 3D folding, you know, until yesterday, what people used to do is that, you know, they used to manually partition a design, and then they would say, well, you know, like, let's using 2D place and route tools, you know, you know, there's this whole EDA, right? Electronic design automation tools, right? So electronic design automation tools that are available commercially, they're not for 3D, they're for, you know, 2D chips, right? So then, you know, what people used to do until yesterday is that they would manually partition a design. They would say, well, you know, based on our experience, we think it's a good idea for this part to go here, the other part to go there, and so on and so forth, and then use these 2D, you know, EDA tools to create those designs, right? You know, like, and kind of glue them together. So that's what people used to do. Now, there is some good work that has happened in academia, you know, uh, that has actually you know, formulated, you know, like, pleasant route, you know, problems in 3D, and they have been trying to solve that, right? So what I'm saying is that even for the very preliminary kind of 3D, you know, I, I, I do not think that it's a done deal, okay? Now when you come to the next 3D kind of an approach that we were talking about, it just, you know, like, the box just opens up, and I think, you know, like, I think multiple PhD thesis can be written out on this. I'll give you one example where you know, we have a lot of experience, right? You know, so, so mostly what people do is that they do not change the architecture and then they try to do 3D. Like for example, the po question that you posed, okay? That, oh, you know, what do I put on what layer, right? For example, most people, I'm not saying you are saying that, but most people, if you ask that question, they would say, oh, for a 2D chip, if that's what you are doing, then for the 3D chip, you decide, you know, what to put on what layer, right? That's what they would do, okay? You know, but 
our experience has been that you could do far better. You know, because now you've got a 3D chip, you, you know, for the same problem, you should think of a different architectural design point. So for example, maybe for a 2D chip, it might make sense, I'm just making this up, right? For a, maybe for a neural net, you know, accelerator, maybe that for a 2D chip, it might make sense to have, you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe 20 Mac units. But maybe for a 3D chip, you could get a far better architectural design point by having, you know, 200 Mac units, right? So these two are clearly different, you know, designs from architectural design points. And that's the kind of stuff that people have to formulate. You know, like whatever I just give this ad hoc example, you know, that has to be done systematically, right? And this is where I think there are lots of open, interesting questions that are there. Does it answer Thank your you. question? May I add, uh, it's a question, it's not an answer. Okay. It's still for you because it's somehow related to what you answered. And um, I, I think Subashi show us, let's say, the promises and the performance gain you can have. But there are many remaining challenges at certain different time horizon. And then it's yield, it's testability of different layers, how you do that to make something very reliable mm -hmm. when you, you do all the stack, because the way we test normal chips is not really the, the same way we will have to, to test this. So um, yield, um, the stability, cost. Fabrication fa time. Fabrication time, who will do that? And, and maybe it's, it's a very complex question. And, and finally, if you would be, from your experience, to, to, to project some killer application where you see there is really attraction for this first 3D chip application, if you can comment on that. I think this would be very interesting for sure. the whole community. So maybe I'll start with the last one because that one is the easy one. You know, I think, I think you know, this AI chips is a perfect example, actually, if, you know, like, it's, a, it's, it's like, you know, it's a perfect storm. You know, it's, it's perfectly made for these kinds of 3D chips, mm -hmm. you know, so, and, and I, I could delve into details. And not just the 3D chips alone. This all, remember, as I said, that having a 3D chip is not good enough because as soon as we have a 3D chip, somebody will have a bigger workload, you know. So this whole notion of this th next 3D mosaic with this illusion, mm -hmm. this 3D plus illusion, these AI workloads are like the perfect example of that, basically, that, you know, like you could use that and you will be able to scale. You know, like, so that's like almost like a killer app and we can get into that, you know. But I think you have very good points about, you know, so let's look into that, right? So I would say, you know, yield, testability and reliability, you know, fabrication time, thermal, right? So let's pick this for, right? You know, for now, right? So let's, let's look at this, right? So yield, you know, you know, like, Professor Ionesco came in a little late, okay, I, I, you know, on my, one of my, my second slide or third slide, I was actually talking about Kilby's Nobel lecture. Mm -hmm. And then Kilby talks about this, Adrian, that, you know, uh, in his Nobel lecture, that when he did the IC, the, the, the people that were against this idea of ICs, they used to complain about three things. The first one was the yield would never be high enough for, you know, even, you know, the integrated circuits. And then, you know, like there were other, other concerns. So what, I, what I'm saying is, obviously, if you put a lot of stuff on, on the chip, you know, yield is something that we have to worry about. But guess what? Yield is something I think we have to worry about even we, before we go to 3D chips. Mm -hmm. And this is where, you know, this notion of architectural repair. Now, remember, I use the word architectural repair. There are actually lots of opportunities to repair a chip. I'm not talking about 3D chip per se, I'm just talking about a complex chip. You know, when I was a student, life was boring. Why? Because people were building these uniprocessors with, you know, a single ALU. What would happen if the ALU broke? You know, you have to throw away the chip, right? Versus if you look at what we build today, even forget about my 3D idea, okay? You know, what we build today is like a distributed system on a chip. And if you build a distributed system on a chip, there are plenty of opportunities, even without using redundancy, without, even without using a lot of redundancy, there are plenty of opportunities to repair a chip, just like 
you know, like when, when a node goes down in the internet, you know, do you put, you know, a lot of redundancy on every node? You do not, right? So, you know, and, and there are papers on this. I'm happy to, you know, talk about the papers if you have specific questions. So that would, this whole notion of architectural repair, I think that will come even before, you know, like we even go to 3D and, and, and I think 3D techniques will, you know, require something like that. On the testability and reliability side, and I can go on record saying this thing, I actually work, I actually consult for, I've been consulting for Google for the past one and a half years. And guess what I consult, you know, on, this is public information now, that data centers today are seeing what are called silent data corruption. Which means what's happening, and, and Google and Facebook have talked publicly about it, they have written papers in the last one year. What's happening is that even in today's chips, in today's complex chips, you know, the defective chips are not getting screened at test time. Mm -hmm. And as a result, there are a test escapes that are actually showing up in the cloud. And what these test escapes are doing is that, so remember, what is a test escape? There is a defective chip. The defective chip does not mean that there is a short between power and ground. A defective chip means that maybe there is a slight open or something like that somewhere inside that chip. And maybe once in a while, you know, this chip produces errors. And the worst part is that, you know, it produces an incorrect computation, but people do not know that the results are wrong. These are called silent errors. So if you look at silent data corruption in the wild, if you can search Google, you will just, you know, find, you know, like, you know, uh, uh, like Google talks about codes that don't count, and, and similarly, Facebook has multiple papers. So this is already a problem, mm -hmm. and we have to back off. Well, I do not say we have to, you know, I'm not speaking by the, on behalf of any company or anything, by the way, I'm just talking about me, Subhashish. This notion that, oh, you know, you test a chip for one second, and that chip is going to now work for five years, that notion has to go away, I think. You know, there is absolutely no scalable way of doing it. What I'm saying, Adrian, is that these problems will come even before we go to the 3D chips. Mm -hmm. So that's why the solutions, you know, fault tolerance and things like that in the field, those things will emerge. That will only help with 3D. You know, so those are the first two. I'll, I'll quickly answer the, you know, the, the processing time. One thing I have to say that, you know, since I was talking about this monolithic 3D, remember I said very carefully, I said that we want, what we want is ultra-dense 3D. Now, monolithically integrating is one way of doing that. You know, but that is not the only, perhaps the, hopefully that's not the only way of doing that, right? Because why? Because if you do this monolithically, as Professor Ionescu was saying, what would happen is that it might take you six months to build a chip because you have so many layers that you have to build, right? And that directly gets into cost aspects that he was talking about. And this is why I'm presenting. I came all the way, you know, and I reached here 1 a.m. in the morning and I'm presenting to you folks because I think some bright person in this room has to figure out a way that we can do ultra-dense 3D without necessarily doing monolithic. I think that would be a fantastic thesis question, basically. And, and whoever can, you know, you know, um, can, can address that challenge you know, will be rich and famous. You know? And that is an open question. But that's a, you know, the, I, I, you know, that question, you know, when I go to bed, I try to think about, do I have an idea for that you know, every day, believe me. So, so that's where I'll stop. Some questions more? Sure. So I have a question for Mr. T uh, Professor Terry. Um, you gave us an overview of uh, the of the laws that the uh, that the EU is imposing on on AI and on these systems, but these laws are often written in lawyer language, right? And we computer scientists, mathematicians, we like to have our problems in real mathematician language where there's numbers and there's formulas. So who should bridge this gap? Should we take their formulations or should they? try to, to come closer to us, or should there be someone else to bridge this gap? So it, it's a good point, and uh, I, I didn't discuss the, the last slide, but uh, if you remember, <coughs> I, I was talking about a global policy with standards, law, 
laws and uh, re it means regulations and um, also ethics on, on the usage. And the, stand the technical standards will be a way to define how to implement, to how to respect the law. And the way to implement the technical standards will be at the beginning quite fuzzy. And more and more we will progress, we will put constraints that will formalize exactly what it, what it means. And it, it is what happens in avionics, for example. In the la last years, the technical standards for avionics said you must use formal methods to prove this, 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 this. After, this is expressed in words, so you have to translate it in mathematical formulas and, and so on, but it, it's more easier. And so I think there is a, a very uh, important role that will be built by academic and in industrials trying to develop the technical standards at this moment. It's something that just starts. You know, I, I, I do want to make a quick comment, but you know, I'm a little worried that this is being recorded. I hope this doesn't get publicized too much, you know, <laughs> which is, I hope it does not become like the ISO 262 safety standard, which has become more like a, I don't know, I'm being recorded, I better not say it, you know. Should I, you know, you know, like, like for example, this ISO 262, 26262, right? This is the safety, automotive safety standard. It sounds like more like a bureaucratic thing rather than real technical stuff. I just, you know, like said it being recorded. So I hope this, uh, this thing does not become something like that. Yes, I think there is risk in, in both sides. It's why I took the example of avionics. <laughs> uh, but, but even if it's bureaucratic, beyond this, this has some formal impl implement, impl uh, implications that the researchers can, can use uh, quite easily. And I think it's a, it's a progress. But we will not have a purely mathematical problem defined by the law saying, OK, now solve this one. No, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, in fact, what, what Subash is saying that maybe in Europe we are very careful, much more careful than other on the societal implication. And we have to be careful that this is not preventing innovation, especially when you want to create startups, companies in Europe, if you regulate too much, of course, we'll have to regulate in, in the data, as you mentioned, there are a lot of characteristics of the data, and then you look at the social implication and how this data is handled. But um, maybe having the scientists as well, having their words say right. when the regulation yeah. are made. And this is the reason there are groups in IEEE, right? There are special groups that I interact between the engineers and the people in politics. Policy. Policy. So there are policy groups of IEEE that are bringing these messages up to, including European Parliament. And this is a way IEEE is acting in reality to, to prevent what you have said. Like, like, like the, the, the ISO 262 guys, right? You know, I'll say it. So that since I, since I said something bad about it, and I better you know, explain in one sentence, right? They talk about, you know, like pick a number, 98% coverage. What does coverage mean? You know, right? You know, depending on, you know, whose coverage metric that is, it can have drastically different implications on the overall safety, for example. And, you know, like, like anyway, so you guys got it. I'm going to shut up. I just want to ask, uh, in, uh, in addition uh, to, to this uh, comment, uh, François, you mentioned that there were like classification of the, uh, of the IE applications according to the risk, like low level risk, moderate risk, and again, how to quantify uh, this application, how we can uh, estimate if it's belonging to the class of high risk or no risk, it's, I mean, if you take safety, we have safety integrity levels where it's saying that if uh, the probability of value is between this and this value, then it's going to this class. And if anything is done for artificial intelligence for this classification, or it's just more intuitive for the moment? 
or how do you see uh, it could I, I be? think the, the, the main point uh, is high risk applications are mainly uh, usage that are already classified in domain, in, in some, some do, usage domain that are already classified as being high risk application, whatever if they use AI or not. So I think this is the point. If you use AI to drive the landing of a, of, of a plane, it is a high risk application. Whatever the AI technology you use, if it is deep learning, expert system, constraint solving, uh, Bayesian uh, uh, inference, it's it just it is an high risk application. So these questions is open only for new kind of applications. And what is important is to say to people, okay, you want to have an application that will assist uh, uh, children to learn uh, um, to learn uh, one particular uh, mathematics. Okay, this application doesn't exist by, a, in fact, it exists, but <laughs> with not such level. Do, does this application trigger a risk for the children? So you will ask the questions, do, 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 I, do I am using in the data I, uh, for learning how to teach to the, to the children some information that are dependent of the social category of the children, of the, its age, of several things, and how I manage this? If you have asked yourself the question, generally you have the answer. If you don't have asked the question, you have to answer and to, 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 to rethink. And I think the good point is there. Say, for all the new applications, they will have to, to say, okay, I consider that I am not high risk. And you can, after the, 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 the populations, the users can say, you are not right, and you will fight. And it's an open process. It will not freeze the, the innovations. Okay, it's more constrained than if you have no constraints, but when you have no constraints, you can have some drawbacks. So. Probably we have to think about some like guides for the new potential applications, uh, how to fold them in different categories of risk. Like uh, the same way is for medical application where we have some device we have to think how it can fold. There is some guides, but yeah, it's a lot of work. I think the, the, the key point was, okay, the builder and the user will be responsible of the impact of the usage of AI-based <laughs> applications. <laughs> when you have said this, okay, everyone would take care. <laughs> Say, okay, no, I don't want to use, I don't want to build. Yeah. And if you are sure, okay, you, you sell. So it's, it, it was a key point, and it was not uh, uh, obvious uh, five years ago. So, so I think it, it is a key point. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, regarding the EU laws that are going to be implemented or are going to be ratified at the moment, uh, do you think there will be like a centralized uh, institution which will evaluate AI systems when they are going to be implemented in the real world? And furthermore, as those systems evolve, uh, they should be also revisited uh, in, a, in an interval. Do you think there's something that could happen uh, when such laws are going into become uh, effective? So what what I see in the discussions is that they consider that you can have any certifications uh, bodies and member and private or public societies that certify if they, they can do the job correctly regarding and, and accordingly to the expectations put in the regulations. So, so they don't consider a single body that will certify all the systems. Uh, a 
Probably we will have uh, certification rules that depends on the domains. Because if you are building AI for avionics, first the regulations for avionics in Europe applies. And this context, these regulations and the related bodies will be in charge to verify the AI systems for avionics. So you will have a multiplicity of bodies. Uh, for high risk systems, it's not allowed to have auto uh, evaluations, which is not the case in in US, for example. Uh, but it, it's it's also something that slows the things clearly. Uh, for medi for uh, medium risk systems, you can have some self uh, assessments. It's 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 allowed. So uh, it was the first part of the question. The second was? The second part is uh, such, such systems evolve. Like if we have self-learning systems, and they, they, will, they will diverge from the initial state. Uh, ah, yes. Yes, yes, OK. So, so there is, in fact, two questions. First, uh, what I saw in the discussion around the, the law concerning AI, uh, the regulation concerning AI and the regulation concerning data is that they want to have something that could be modified and revised quite uh, regularly according to the advance of the technology. This is the first time it, hap it happens. So, so we will see if <laughs> the lawyers are, are so agile to, to make change very quickly, but they, they, they try to, to manage this. So it's good, one good point regarding the regulation itself. And after regarding the systems, the, at these times, we have no certification of high risk systems that allows to modify anything in the systems after its, certifi its, its certifications. So if you are doing dynamic, continuous learning, reinforcement learning, what you want during the life of your applications, you are outside the certification scope, so you cannot be certified. But there is a lot of research with interesting uh, approach, and we have some also uh, on our labs, trying to uh, associate to the AI application, neural networks generally, some safety bags with more robust AI uh, technologies. They don't perform the task, but that, that are able just to see if the system goes outside its domain uh, of uh, operation. And it seems that this could be not equivalent to perform the task, so simpler, and thus Easier, e easier certificable, and that could be sufficient to ensure a certification of the whole system. Because if you have something that is able to say, okay, there is a problem now, stops, and if you have a, a, a safe uh, stop, it's, it solves the problems. So it's, I think it's one of the main trends to try to associate the benefits of very advanced AI and certifications. Could you just uh, comment if I can? So I, I've seen something um, from one year, I'm in this IEEE policy group for ICT, and I, I think the rule is very simple. The regulation is EU level, and the certification bodies will be national level. So it's like you implement, and different countries may have this to fulfill with. It is like, you know, you go for a clinical trial, but you have to go in Switzerland to Swiss Medic, right? and same in different countries. So this was my understanding, that you will have national bodies defined, but they have to certify against the regulation at the EU level. So this would be more or less the approach mm. with certain variation in the implementation. This is what I learned from, from this group. Mm. Oh, and, yeah, and, and you have, can have several national bodies. For example, in cyber security, there are sev several certification centers yes, uh, in, the same, in the same state. But they depend on the state pol policy. Yes. It's clear. Thank you. More questions? Um, I have a question regarding uh, in-memory computation. 
And with respect to the libraries, um, do you think it will require very specific libraries, such as the one that there is for NVIDIA with its CUDA library, to run frameworks on it to train and infer models? Okay, so let's try to define what in-memory computing is, <laughs> okay? Because, you know, I, I, I think Professor Mutlu was also talking about this thing. So, so in-memory computing is such a very generic term, right? So, so, so this is how I use it, okay? I say computing inside memory, com computing inside a memory array, and computing right outside the memory array, okay? So now you tell me, uh, in your in-memory computing, which kind are you talking about? Can we do the three? <laughs> okay, okay, so, 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 so I think computing right outside the memory array is, you know, well, if I may use the word easier, you know, with the advent of accelerators, you know, and especially, you know, domain-specific accelerators, I think computation right outside the memory array is going to happen. You know, it's already happening, you know, and more and more of that will happen, you know, right? And, and there, you know, it's slightly different from, you know, like what NVIDIA was trying to do because they were trying to provide a language so that you can program your, uh, you know, like GPUs, right? Uh, yeah, similar frameworks, you know, even for example, you know, everybody else uses other frameworks, right, for AI engines, for example. Sure, you know, and, and then the question would be, if somebody designs an accelerator, you know, like how would they, you know, manage that and so on and so forth. So, so I think that's going to happen, this computation right outside the memory area. You know, like whether it is 3D or non, even with 2D, that's going to happen, okay? Now the question really then comes down to this computation inside the memory array that some people talk about, right? For example, you know, especially with, you know, this resistive RAM kind of memory technologies, there's a lot of talk about using Kharkov's laws to, you know, uh, you know do multiply accumulate kind of operations basically, right? So that's the computation um, inside the memory array. Is anybody here working on that sort of thing? Or is very passionate about it? I work in, in SRAM computing. In SRAM, in, inside SRAM computing, right, okay. So, so, I, I, okay, so I, 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 will, I will not talk about inside SRAM computing. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll stick to inside RRAM computing that some people talk about. I think what's going on is that the people, so there is a big disconnect between the people that work on this kind of inside memory array computing, for example, you know, you know, like using this Kharkov's laws for, you know, you know, like using current summation and things like that, and people that actually, you know, build hardware. I think there is a big disconnect in the following sense. The, 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 the first group of people, they would, you know, build a tiny memory array and then they would say, oh, you know, look, you know, how efficient that is, right? But when you actually look at, you know, like a large neural net application, obviously your neural net, you know, is not going to fit inside that memory array. So, and if you do not fit inside that memory array, then it doesn't really matter how much of your, you know, like Mac unit computations you have done inside the memory array, you know, you will have Amdahl's law come and bite you and take away all your benefits because you will have these intermediate results coming out and what are you going to do with those intermediate results, for example. That's just one example that I gave. So I think this computation inside the memory array, that's in its infancy. I'm not saying that that's not going to fly, okay, because you never want to say that because some genius is going to come and will make that work. But I think it's very, very far from, you know, uh, practical usage and for those, the question comes that how do you have language constructs? You know, even if that flies, even if it can show benefits at a system level, which today nobody has shown any benefit of any kind of those kinds of computation inside memory areas at a system level. You know, uh, even if there were benefits, then the question would be what would be the language construct so that people can understand when they build hardware. But that's less of an issue for computation right outside the memory area. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Uh, more? Yeah. 
Uh, yesterday, we have seen how to bring software to the hardware by Professor Alfrug. And today, we have seen you have an algorithm and you design a piece of hardware for it that it's specialized. Uh, what do you think are the perspectives for design on the system level where you just have a problem specification and you build software and hardware in a holistic uh, environment? Well, that had been the holy grail. You know, and, uh, but actually, you know, good progress has been made. You know, there's this whole field of hardware software co-design and, you know, and one of the early pioneers of that field is actually one of your professors here at EPFL, Professor DeMichele, you know, like when he was at Stanford, you know, like, you know, like one of his students actually did one of the, I think the earliest PhD thesis on this notion of hardware software co-design. Now, of course, at, I think at that time they were looking at, you know, like what do you build in hardware and what do you, you know, like program and so, you know, like on the processor and so on. I think there is another aspect of hardware software core design that's going on right now with the accelerators, you know, which is that, you know, like, even if you build an accelerator, right? Now this, this is where, you know, edge versus the cloud will make a big difference, by the way. You know, like, especially if you think of building stuff for the cloud, right? So, you know, you're not going to just build a specific accelerator to do something very specific, right? you're going to build a very programmable accelerator. Now, program, you know, like programming an accelerator is very different than programming a processor in some sense. And this is where, you know, he was asking the question about CUDA and languages like that for GPUs. And I was talking about software frameworks for machine learning, for example, for accelerators, for example, that are used in the cloud, right? Versus, you know, since this is a workshop on edge AI, the question that it would boil down to is what is this amount of software that you want to run for an edge chip that would be running on the uh, processor? And even for our, for example, Chimera chip that I was showing, right? So there is a RIS-5 processor, for example, and then there is an accelerator. And we do run certain operations that are not very frequent and, you know, like we do not have hardware implementations. So we actually did, you could call it ad hoc you know, uh, hardware software co-design. Uh, and that definitely has to be systemized. And that is definitely a big research question. Thank you. More questions? Uh, I have a question about the commercialization of uh, commercialization of this kind of technology the um, like uh, uh, the, the next 3d the near, near memory computing I mean even though the problem is very clear the memory wall however like uh, we still like we don't see a broad uh, commercialization in our right. device so you know commercialization is not going to happen overnight you know you know it's not going to be that oh you know we, you wake up one fine morning and suddenly something will happen right I think it would be very slow because, you know, these are pretty radical concepts, right? Even, you know, like even putting an RAM on a chip with a silicon chip, right? And then using it, you know, for whatever, you know, like applications, right? It's a, it's a pretty big risk if you think about, you know, like if I were like working for a company and I was responsible for a product for that company, and somebody comes and says, oh, you know, here is this new memory technology that is integrated with silicon, and, you know, I don't want to be the first person to take that risk, right? You know, like, definitely not, right? So this is where I think, uh, but progress is being made at the same time, you know, in all fronts, you know. So, for example, I mentioned, and I'll leave it at that level, that, you know, one of my former students you know, he has been working very closely with, you know, analog devices, for example. And and he has convinced those people to put some of these technologies in their industrial fabs, which is not easy. And I'm sure those companies won't just go and put some technology in their fab for no reason, right? You know, so I think things will happen. Things are moving. I think I think the pain point is being failed by everybody. 
and when there is a pain point being felt then you know like you know like people will be more open to solutions but it will take it will be very slow it's not going to be that you wake up one fine morning and lo and behold you know these things you know but 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 if you, if you think about right you know even uh e like even chiplets okay you know uh the idea of chiplets is not new it had been you know like it has been there for a very long time it's only now recently that you know companies have woken up and they're like oh you know we have to use chiplets for example right so i think you know all these things will you know ultimately it will be a very organic uh development you know you wanted to say something adrian oh but but you you make the point uh, this is a um, the agi is something different and you try to build agi yeah. which finally and i have not heard this too much the real time part is very important mm -hmm. so you cannot necessarily use the cloud right forget That's about correct. it That's correct. so you have to be on the edge real time limited resources in a certain footprint and you want to build that and, on and, you, and you want to do ambitious tasks ambitious tasks and you want to build that on a platform of technology that was not initially developed for that purpose That's right, right. Yes. and and that makes you know even for your work question the task very difficult because if you want to have immediate application and use of this is is not that easy it does not come immediately but in, in this context um maybe something interest, interesting to comment is however uh, you see that in in different it was the question about markets where we will see kind of first successes with dedicated hardware software core design you know and on the edge we say that is designed it end to end finally because it's not like a general purpose processor for that right so which domain do you, this is autonomous driving it's um, i don't know other other field do, do, how how do you feel this market especially you've been in contact with tsmc and so on <laughs> so i do not know about market right but clearly this is already happening today in the cloud you know like if you look at all the training and the tpus for example right in the cloud you know i would not call it a market per se because it's not like you have a billion users you know not in that sense right but absolutely in the cloud you know the all the deployments have this notion of hardware software code design completely you know uh uh like there you know and that's how they are building it in the their the, the way they build their hardware and the software stack is even you know specialized towards those thing you know like uh, i don't want to get into more details but uh the f it's a true hardware software core design there you know like in the cloud for sure that i think the trouble for the 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 edge is that i think nobody has been able to figure out that even though you know there is this nebulous notion that you know like the whole you know the world's population would be the users but i do not think that there is any owner of this thing and that's the problem right which is very different from the cloud because you know that microsoft has to run their cloud so they are clearly the owner for whatever that is and google and 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 so on and so forth versus for the edge it's more like you know it's everybody's problem but nobody is really responsible for it you know so i actually know that some companies for example have tried this new memory technologies and this sort of thing for automotive for example not necessarily autonomous but automotive in general and but the trouble there is that you know like talking about risks <laughs> you know reliability you know like you know like you know like who wants to t who who's going to take that risk you know as you know so so i do not know the answer to the specific question that what would be the market for the aji who will first embrace that you know i guess you know they need somebody like apple or someone like you know like isn't it true that apple was the one who really embraced you know flash you know for their phones you know and stuff like that or the or the digital cameras you know like you know like that's how flash actually happened right 
people used to say that flash would never happen and then you know with the digital cameras embracing flash and then apple and for iphones and things like that i do not know you know again i'm going on record i my background in that kind of market adoption is very shaky so but i think we need some people like that you know like i think it will be very slow and then people will see the value and then more people will jump into it i think thank you um unfortunately professor teria had to leave us uh, for to catch his train but we still have some some time uh, if you have more questions because we shrink our uh, lunch time so we we can have some room for the questions if you have any any more sure Thank you. Um, what is your take on, on, on what the, the mobile manufacturers are doing now? I mean Google, Apple. So we see more and more AJI, uh, let's say, functionalities on the phones. And it gives the impression that it's pretty advanced from this perspective. So what's your opinion on that? Yeah, I think, you know, well, for technology-wise, they are just using conventional technologies for various reasons. First of all, you know, it matches their needs and, you know, cost and things like that. But there is more and more push to, especially if you look at, you know, not just phones, but AR, VR, and metaverse and things like that. So, you know, if you look at at least some of those, you know, workloads that, you know, that people are looking at, for example, uh, I think there is a notion that, like, something else has to happen. You know, like, it may not be that just using existing ways of doing things will be good enough. Uh, like, obviously, the first, you know, uh, from a hardware design standpoint, the first lever would be to, you know, be domain-specific as much as possible. And that is the knob that everybody is playing right now, right? And, and that gets you there, right? You know, so if you can fit your neural nets into whatever, you know, form factor you got, that would be a good first start, right? Why won't you do that? But, you know, but that implies that either it is true that those, those neural nets are never going to grow because, you know, people will be able to figure out ways of doing things, which is, by the way, is an, algor is an example of an algorithmic co-design, for example, right? Or I think, you know, people have to think of more radical approaches. Adrian, you want to comment? <laughs> I, I think your question is an interesting one, but from another perspective, because, you know, finally, what is or what will be the smartphone could open another dimension. And there is a topic in which we, Jan, we are discussing a lot in the center, the fact that this may be the interface to this dimension of predictive tools like digital twins, that you build based on inter information collected at the edge. And it can also benefit for federated learning in which you are not necessarily sharing your data with others, but you are optimizing models that are predictive. And the only, or among the very few interfaces that you have with you with a certain capability, and, and, and then this is an edge device. Now we are talking about extreme edge devices that at extreme edge you have even less power, less than milliwatt, for instance, while here you still have watts. It can be such a human machine interface towards a digital twin that is in your pocket and it gives you tools that we do not have today, right? Tools that predict health, predict events, and they can be personalized according to the experiences that you have with this tool. And I think we are not so much talking, but I think this is extremely exciting dimension. And here it's about hardware, software, co-design, co-integration, but also taking into account this dimension, how this is integrated in a digital tool concept. And uh, digital twin, sorry, concept. And I, I think that that's a new dimension and this goes beyond you know, the normal usage of a, of a smartphone. Uh, 
And there, I think, is a lot of things. I don't know how many of these things will happen, but certainly some will happen in the future. So, so this is the digital twin of yourself, of oneself, pretty much? What is, it that, what is the twin of? That's what everybody is asking. Yeah, it, I mean, this is, I'm, I was talking about this digital twin that are related to, to the healthcare domain, but... Right, right, right. So, so essentially, there will be a model, a, you know, a digital twin model built for my health, basically, you know, like so, by collecting data and how I'm reacting, there will be a yeah. model of that. Yeah, I can compare, for instance, how you do in sports, right? You are doing training, and you can compare your performance to the average performance. You see your yeah, progress yeah, and yeah. so on. So it it will start step by step like that. So you can have what is called early sign early detection that is part of yeah. the Petri healthcare as compared to reactive healthcare. This is one example, but but you know that these models are already deployed in Industry 4.0. Right with huge efficiency, right? Because they predict w how a process under Failure, certain cir like under varying circumstances, yeah. how you adapt in real time in order to still perform well. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think, the, coming back to the question, for the moment, the, the tool that we have in our hands every day is the smartphone, or maybe, but this less when, a, a, you know, a smartwatch and so on, but then it's less computational power. Yeah. Yeah. I think this is something great will happen, and there is a lot of innovation, and it will drive some of the hardware development. Right. Be because if you go now, we have kind of list at the edge what hard hardware has to do. Should be real time. You should have a certain flexibility in form factor. Should be energy efficient. Um, you should also embed security privacy into it. Um, then there are other things related to standardization and so on. So there is a list. And then you have to go to all the functionality, computation, sensor communication interfaces, um, not only energy related to, to, you know, if it's um, rechargeable, not rechargeable, harvesting and so on. Even somebody from Industry 4 told me, you know, the battery, it, it, you know, all this crazy stuff has to run on battery for at least six months. Yep. If it is less than six months, you know, if you have to replace, if you have to replace your battery, you know, in fewer than six months, then it's a non-starter, for example. So just think about go figure, right? Yeah. You know, all this crazy stuff. You know, essentially you have a model for yourself. That's what I wanted to ask. You know, like with respect to, for example, health, right? Yeah. And all that has to happen. That means that you have to incrementally learn, right? You know, it's not just inference. And all that in, like, you know, like on battery, you know, small coin cell battery running for over six months. Yeah. That's pretty exciting. Good. We have one more question. Well, um, you have talked about the issues associated with the current architectures at Gridland, like uh, this memory wall and stuff. But how do you see the alternative architectures, such as um, quantum computing and neuromorphic computing, fit into this and into the paradigm of machine learning in general? Quantum computing, you know. <laughs> I, I, I can answer a bit of how quantum, maybe you take neuromorphic or you can share. Um, so th there is a future where there will be probably specific problem that can be treated better by one another. I mean, there is a huge investment uh, uh, in, in uh, quantum computing everywhere with a lot of claims that, you know, you'll see that people are targeting now hundreds of qubits and then uh, maybe they declare in one or two years they have the first 1,000 qubit computer. However, however, all this quantum computing now is based, is more like cloud technology, right? It's something you have to access because everything is at millikelvin and um, is consuming, you know, all, all the fridges around, dilution free, whatever you have, with consume 10, 15 kilowatt. Then if you normalize per what you compute, then you may find that is efficient. But this you will not place it in your pocket. So quantum whatever is, if it's simulation of quantum system or for cryptography or for um, Whatever is, I mean, uh, there is a, 
I was yesterday in a quantum meeting in which Roche is trying to think about using quantum computing in discovery of new type of drugs, right? Because they have to simulate certain molecules with a normal computer, even with a very, uh, you know, high performance computing facility, it will take years. So, but these are very specific thing, right? So quantum will not replace the majority of application that we have now, but they will do much better in certain type of problem that are not tractable by this. I mean, this, this is what I see today, at least very modestly with what we understand from quantum computing. And they need as well uh, the same thing, algorithms, because how a quantum computer is working, you, you sometimes, you know, you have to repeat multiple time the experiment and, and to learn what is happening. Yeah, the degree of confidence, what is happening. So it's not that obvious and the error correction and there are many things. So I think neuromorphic is something much more interesting. I will let Sebastian to, to discuss, but I think for neuromorphic there is a place at the edge because it's essentially to, to save power and energy and maybe for event detection things that are very, maybe I let you comment a bit more on that. Sure, but sure. I think neuromorphic is much more relevant. Sure, so you know, so, you know, just like I was talking about, you know, this computation, you know, like in-memory computing, I think this neuromorphic has become like that also. Because originally, the idea of neuromorphic was that, you know, you, you use transistors in a particular way to mimic, you know, what the neurons do, do inside the brain. That's sort of what neuromorphic used to be. And then, you know, like there were these two camps for a while, you know, the neural networks people, because neural networks have nothing to do with the brain, really, right, you know. And then the, the classical neuromorphic people. Now, the trouble is, you know, people know so little about the brain anyway. So I, you even wondered that whether this, you know, the classic neuromorphic stuff, like how much it has to do with the brain. But having said that, I think it is fair to say that what has happened over the past, you know, several years is that, you know, while there is a lot of promise with all this neuromorphic stuff, I think the neural networks have won very significantly. You know, I, I think it is fair to say that. I think neuromorphic has not shown, you know, like a real, you know, aha moment yet, right? But, uh, so that's why now the, now the people that work on neural, ne now the people that used to, you know, work on neuromorphics and now they have moved to neural nets. Now neural nets are new neuromorphic, you know, like a lot of people when they say neuromorphic, they mean neural nets, okay? I have seen that, okay? So, but you, clearly you're not asking that question, right? You are talking about this classical neuromorphic. I think, you know, there is still a, like a group of people, you know, I have a good friend who is in that camp basically. They think that, you know, the new discoveries about the brain that are happening those might lead to interesting new architectures. Uh, like for example, I, I'll just be very concrete. You know, there is a professor at Stanford, his name is Professor Kwabina Bohen. And actually he has gone and he has actually given talks, you know, where he talks about these 3D architectures, you know, like, you know, and, and he believes that by learning stuff from the brain, you know, like, that would be the key to building the future 3D architecture to solve uh, these problems. Now, whether you call it neuromorphic or non-neuromorphic, we may not get into that. But that sort of thing, I think, a lot of people think will happen. So, so, well, of course, I'm a digital person, right? Yeah, what do you think I will answer, you know? You know very well that there is a... Yeah. There is an energy type of challenge that people are saying in analog domain. The thing, you know, so actually one of my colleagues, he is an analog expert, his name is Professor Boris Marman. He actually has written a very nice, you know, overview article, you know, on this. You know, I think it came out in the transactions on VLSI, and, and I would encourage everybody to read it, you know, and his argument is the following, that if, if you want kind of, you know, precision above, you know, three or four bits, then, you know, like, analog doesn't have a story. 
you know so it's you know like it's only for you know like when your precision is less than 3 bits or 4 bits whatever boris has in his paper you know that's where analog might have a story but the issue is that remember like this is what you know professor mutlu was talking about earlier this morning when you are talking about a 2 bit multiplier by the way a 1 bit multiplier is an and gate okay and you know that's a 1 bit multiplier right so when you are talking about a 1 or 2 bit multipliers for example or adders with such few bits you know one has to be very careful you know to see that you know like how much benefit there really is you know for you know digital versus analog uh but that's the space we are talking about okay now it might be true that so 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 that's the first point okay the second point is that you know i do not think that one will just go and build the whole system as an analog design i i think i think that you know that will just kill everything perhaps okay so which means because if you think of a neural net problem for example right you still have to think of data flows because you still have to access weights and then still have to do some computation on those weights and then you know and then you have to still you know pass on the results to some other you know block and so on and so forth right so these are like very digital data flows if you think about now it might be possible so for example there was a student danny bankman you know who was a student of boris marman you know and they had a paper in isscc 2018 i think you know or 2019 i'm forgetting where what they were doing is that i think 2018 that you know they were taking some very specific blocks so you almost build a digital system and then you say aha this particular block in the digital system instead of building it digitally if i just replace it with a mix signal implementation i might get some energy efficiency benefits mm -hmm. so that's an example of think digital and build selectively analog for example and that's kind of stuff might happen actually so so it, but this whole notion that oh you know like digital computing is going to go away and you know this suddenly this analog computing is going to take over which by the way is being you know touted by certain camps i do not think that's happening in like i do not see that happening thank you uh we are one hour of panel now so if um uh, me uh, i think it was very successful i don't have to use any of my <laughs> written questions but uh, if you have one two questions which you couldn't ask so far is anybody who is working on analog computing in this room that gives the answer to you adrian <laughs> I understand that's why I, that's why I said what I said you know Yeah 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 But the trouble is that those communities you know do not answer these questions about data flows about you know they will just show you one tiny block and they will say oh you know see you know there is so much benefit over there but that's in that block but that block has to exist in a you know in a in a larger context and you know and that's where the benefits go away well uh any more questions the last one maybe <laughs> okay thank you very much thank, thank you, you participants it was very interesting discussion so i announce a break 15 minutes and then we have still the poster session you can discuss and uh,